Today, I want to tell you the story of Amelie and how we helped her get a voice, how we helped her to regulate and calm herself. And Amelie was diagnosed with ASD with autism spectrum disorder. And for her, it, you know, it, it, as the parents say, it wasn't a gift like it is for so many other kids. It was a challenge, a burden to overcome. At 14 months, she was developing relatively normally, but she had a regression at that point, like we see in so many kids that have ASD. And what happened was she, you know, she had a few words part of that, but she lost her, her speech. She wasn't able to have verbal communication. She started having really large behavioral outbursts where she'd be screaming for hours on end and she wasn't playing with others anymore. And when she'd have those behavioral outbursts, the, the longest one they had was she was screaming consistently, constantly for about 26 hours straight, which is something that, you know, sadly we see a lot in kids that have autism is in, they develop pans and pandas and autoimmune issues and neural inflammation. And that triggers a lot of this distress. And I'm going to break all that down for you guys in this video. I'm going to show you her, I'm going to show you the labs. I'm going to show you the neurological findings that we found. And I'm going to walk you guys through why that happened in the first place. I'm going to let the mom tell you a lot of this in her own words. So, you know, she had said that she's in a chronic fight or flight state. And I was like, we have to stop and just take a minute here because six months ago, mm -hmm. I had to sneak out mm -hmm. like the house, mm -hmm. like to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And if she found me in the bathroom, like that was awful <laughs> because she, I don't know if I remember telling you, but like I would, I got to the point where I'd just not really drink in the day because she hated coming to the bathroom so much. Yeah. She would hit her head against the wall. She would bite me. She was yeah. angry yeah. about that. And again, this is something you, how do you explain that to other parents? Like, oh, by the way, I, I stopped drinking water most days because she's so, she'll start hitting her head against the wall if I go to the bathroom. Yeah. Even if she's with me, it's mm -hmm. not like I'm not there. Yeah. Um, like one of the biggest things that she could not, um, not have eyes on, sorry, on me the whole time. Mm -hmm. She was so frightened, mm -hmm. like of everything. Um, to the point where I remember Dr. Tanner coming out and he was like, we'll just take her back now. And I was like, nope. <laughs> I know you do this for other kids. I'm like, not my kid. And he was like, no, no, she'll be fine. And I was like, <laughs> no, no, mm -hmm. I'm coming back. Mm -hmm. Because she was in such a state of like heightened stress mm -hmm. with moving from one room to the other or mm -hmm. like going in to have breakfast, getting out of the car. Just the smallest of things were just, I don't know, so frightening for her. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard to explain until I heard some of like Dr. Josh's stuff and I'm mm -hmm. like, he gets it. Mm -hmm. Okay, he gets this. And lastly, she was also having uh, what looked like absent seizures. So I noticed multiple of them in the office. Um, the mom had mentioned that she's seen this multiple times as well. Um, but since therapy, we really haven't seen these events nearly as much. But what we found in her exam is, tip, is what we find in so many kids that have autism. And it's and there's a lot of research behind this too. So number one, we found a, a metabolic dysfunction, which for people who don't know what that means, it means they don't produce energy efficiently. And that can happen for a multitude of reasons. It could happen from infections. It could happen from mold. It could happen from genetic issues. It could happen from um, chronic neural inflammation. It can happen from gut issues, but it, it can happen from a lot of different areas. But what, ha what that simply means is they're not able to produce enough energy. Well, if your brain isn't able to produce enough energy, it can't create an appropriate react uh, response so like for example let's say there is the brain that help her regulate and stay calm if we don't have enough energy in those systems they can't do that and the brain goes haywire we see all these massive behavioral outbursts and dysregulation simply put and this is found uh dr fry he did a study um when i read the other day it was in 2012 and found that 80 percent of kids with autism have a metabolic dysfunction and i 100 percent agree the, uh, we see this so often. And so what we did with her is we did a ton of photobiomodulation and low-level light therapy and because that's been shown to increase mitochondrial function. Simple. We gave her oxygen while she's here. We did hyperbarics because we need oxygen to produce more ATP and produce um, more mitochondrial function and energy. So we did that. And these are therapeutic strategies that have a ton of research behind them that have been shown to address some of these underlying mechanisms of autism. Um, and we also know that these kids have a large amount of neural inflammation, which again, both of those therapeutics 
help a ton with that. So we did that. Um, she was already on a pretty strict diet and she was, you know, gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, which was super helpful. Um, but we had her start increasing fats, proteins, lower carbohydrates to get some of those, a little bit of ketone bodies because ketone bodies are extremely anti-inflammatory, especially for neural inflammation. And you could tell that this mitochondrial system was so inefficient because any time there was stress in her environment or you had her do an activity, this whole system would shut down. And it wouldn't be right away. You know, it'd, it'd take just a little bit of stress. And what would happen is that system would get fatigued out and then we would start seeing behavioral issues, right? And what we noticed is as we started lasering more, as we started doing hyperbarics, she could handle a little bit more before we got that response. And we kind of constantly monitored that response of, is this too overwhelming for her? And we slowly built that up because for you to get more mitochondria, you have to activate that system and you have to do it in a range that they can handle. If you just go to, went in and you did a massive amount of stimulation, you're, you're gonna cause a lot of issues. But if you work slowly and build up their endurance to different activities, slowly over time, you build more mitochondria, therefore they can handle more. And now you started a positive cycle forward. So that's really what we did from a therapy aspect of, um, we worked on you know different aspects of stressing these systems, but at levels that she could handle to help build that mitochondria while we were lasering, while we were um, giving oxygen, you know, after she was in the hyperbarics, things like that to help make sure we had a lot of resources there. So when we went to stimulate her brain, we actually had resources and energy there so we could get development and not just stress her brain out. What we also found is we found a lot of retained primitive reflexes. So the first one we found is what's called a Moro or a startle reflex. This is one where we tip her back quickly, remove her quickly, or lighter sound comes in pretty abrasively and she startles. So her pupils dilate, heart rate goes up and her arms come out and come up like that. Just like when you're holding an infant, you drop kind of quickly or someone makes a loud noise, their arms come out. That's a startle reflex. And it should go away in the first like three to four months of life. When it doesn't, what happens is uh, every time they move too quickly or sound or light comes in too abrasively, they startle, their pupils dilate, their heart rate goes up and they get into a state of fight or flight. Well, she was chronically in a state of fight or flight because anytime she moved, it would elicit this. Anytime the environment changed, it would elicit this response that should have been gone at three to four months of life. So we worked on that reflex a ton. She had a lot of sensory reflexes and I'm gonna talk a lot about um, some of the neural inflammatory markers that we found and, and how they relate back to this, but she had a lot of sensory reflexes. She had a lot of sensory issues. And um, so she had a spinal gallant reflex on her back that can cause like chronic fidgeting and bedwetting and um, just ir more or less uh, abnormal movement. She had an asymmetrical tonic neck reflex and that plays a lot into gross motor development, plays a lot into brain development. If it doesn't go away, we can't develop our gross motor skills appropriately. If our gross motor skills don't develop appropriately, the rest of our brain doesn't develop appropriately because our brain develops out of movement, simply put. <laughs> And she also had uh, a Babinski reflex on the bottom of her foot, which is a sign of, of cortical maturation or brain development. She had a Palmer grasp reflex. She had rooting reflexes still. She had all these sensory reflexes because that sensory system wasn't well developed. And that's what that shows. When we have retained primitive reflexes, it shows us that there's areas of, of our central nervous system, of our peripheral nervous system that are not integrated appropriately or developed appropriately. So we did a massive amount of rehab uh, over a three-week period to help to start to inhibit those primitive reflexes and start to sh regulate that system. And as we did that, miracles started to happen. Massive things started to change. And I'm going to let the mom tell you all about that one. But before I do that, not only do I want to talk about that neurological aspect, but I also want to talk about these metabolic aspects that no one looks at in kids, which is, is wild because we know kids with ASD have massive amount of neural inflammation. Well, why do they have it? is the most important question you can ask yourself, ask your provider, is why are kids having... So in her, we found um, a lot of stuff, to be honest. We found that she has a, a mycotoxicity, a mold toxicity. She had gliotoxins and ochratoxins, which those have been shown over and over again to suppress the immune system, to create delays, to create brain inflammation, which we can't have if we want to rehab a child. She also had thallium. She had a heavy metal toxicity, that again is known to cause cognitive and developmental delays. And lastly, she had a pesticide in her system that shouldn't be there as well, right? And a lot of this comes back to agricultural environment and all these things that are starting to create a lot of inflammation for kids and 
why it, honestly the underlying contributing factors to why we're having so many kids with developmental delays is because we our environment has so many burdens on these kids that we just can't adapt to. We also ran a test called the Neural Zoomer Plus through Vibrant Labs, and what it looks for is it looks for markers for neurological autoimmunity, which she had an array of. She had anti-Purkinje cells. These are uh, cells inside of our cerebellum that what they do is they're connected to like 100,000 neurons, but what they do is they gate sensory information coming in. They calm that sensory information coming in. When they're dysfunctional, what happens is the world is very bright. It's very abrasive, extremely overwhelming when these when these are dysregulated. Also, they play a lot into our motor development. They play a lot into our movement. And when they're involved, we won't typically develop our primitive reflexes. We won't typically develop our motor skills appropriately, which again, if we don't develop our motor systems, we don't develop our brain appropriately. And that's the reason why you see all of our videos, why you see all these kids getting better is because their motor systems are getting better because it is the foundation of our brain development. Something else that's interesting is she had uh, anti-GABA receptor antibodies, and GABA is what calms the brain. Something else that we did during therapy is we use violet light a lot with her. Violet light has been shown in, in research uh, in rat models to actually increase density of Purkinje cells and also increase GABA in the brain. And this is exactly what we've seen over and over and over again is kids that have ASD, when we use a violet laser with them, they calm down dramatically because they get more GABA. Their sensory systems calm down because those Purkinje cells are actually getting more density is at least what the research is showing. And that's what we see clinically as well. And then she had a bunch of other blood brain barrier disruptors, brain inflammatory markers that we needed to get calmed down. So we used photobiomodulation to help with that. We use diet, we use hyperbarics because that's been shown to help do that as well. And then also even just simply activating the brain decreases brain inflammation. We get brain-derived neurotropic factors, so we start getting more connectivity. And so we can start getting more connectivity, decreasing inflammation, and getting better function. And that's why we've started to see massive changes in her. Um, she wouldn't acknowledge, like, her cousins. Mm -hmm. with, yeah, I remember you like, talking about that a lot. Ugh, that's so brutal, and I know... Like a lot of people will say it's just how they are, but she couldn't acknowledge them or be aware of them because it was so much overload. Yeah. So, and I just, in my heart, like didn't believe that that was the case. I didn't believe that a child just doesn't want to connect with any other child or adult. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a tough gig, like every day, like the anxiety of, are we gonna get out of the house today? Yeah. Or are we just not going to try because it's too stressful for all of us? Yeah. Um, and then, so we did three weeks here mm -hmm. and went to Vancouver. I was like, this is, this is awesome. a breeze. Oh mm -hmm. my God. Is this what like regular parenting is <laughs> like? I'm like, dude, 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 this is, this is all right. Yeah. I can do um, this. Yeah. Like I could breathe. Mm -hmm. I could just take a minute and breathe. Um, and then... Like those changes just kept carrying on mm -hmm. over time. And we carried on our work. Yeah. We are. You guys are dedicated laser to. Laser crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love the laser. Um, we do our HBOT at home. Mm -hmm. And this was a big thing for mm -hmm. her. Um, every time we came out, she started babbling and she'd point at colors. And I emailed you and I was like, mm -hmm. it's the HBOT. Yeah. And you were like, yep, cool. Yep. <laughs> Keep doing it. <laughs> okay. So you heard it from mom what changes happened after the first intensive. And we truly did an intensive. We saw her th for three weeks straight every day, two hours a day for rehab. It was an intense model that we, that we did with her. And that's what we do with kids that have autism is because when we do that, their results are dramatic. And the reason why all of this changed is simple. We started, we got inflammation down. We got more energy to her system for that mitochondria, for that energy production system. And then we activated her brain, which primarily was her cerebellum, which is the weak area of the brain. You know, she, and we did that by getting rid of primitive reflexes because those have to develop for those that your, uh, that midline cerebellum to start to develop. That midline cerebellum has a nucleus in it called your fastigial nucleus, and that regulates our limbic system or our emotional regulation centers. If it's delayed in its development, we can't regulate appropriately. It also, your cerebellum is the largest input into your higher cortex for cognitive skills. 
Um, but that midline cerebellum has to develop first. And that's really what we worked on in that first intensive is getting that midline cerebellum to start to activate and start to develop. Then when we get out to our like interposed nucleus or, or our medial aspects of that cerebellum, we start that plays a lot into sensory function, plays a lot into a lot of our like shoulder and hip mo uh, function and our movement patterns. And then our lateral cerebellum is our dentate nucleus, and that plays a ton into fine motor skills and then speech development because our lateral cerebellum is what develops our speech centers. And what a lot of people don't know is when you look at the cerebellum, that midline aspect starts to develop as an infant starting to lift their head, as they're starting to roll, use their core, everything in the midline of the body, using their core musculature because that's what develops that. Then when they get on their hands and knees and start using their hips and their shoulders, they start developing those medial areas. Then as they sit up, they start grabbing stuff, putting stuff in their mouth, start to speak. They start developing those lateral aspects. But what happens when we get so much neural inflammation from all these different exposures is that system can't mature. It can't grow. It can't develop the way it's supposed to, the way God intended it to. And what we simply did is educate them on these things, remove some of these things, got them tools to decrease inflammation. And so they were lasering at home. They're using hyperbarics at home got them tools to start decreasing that neural inflammation. And then we give them strategies to activate those areas of the brain in the appropriate developmental sequence. And this is what we do with every kid that comes in here. And what happens every single time, or nearly every single time, is the brain starts to change. The body starts to change. The kid starts to adapt and grow. And that's what you're seeing with Amelie here, is her brain is now able to start to change because we've created an environment that is conducive to that. It's simple. It's not rocket science. I promise you. I've done, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of these kids. It is not rocket science. You just have to get them enough energy and you just have to activate the brain in the appropriate sequence and they will start to change. And they're not only the child's life will change, but the whole family's life will change and decrease that stress. And then you have a system that you can start building off of with more and more complex therapies over time. But you just got to get the ball rolling. And I hope this helps you guys out there, parents out there. I hope this helps you understand a little bit more. Providers, I hope this helps you understand a little bit more because this is so easy to implement when you understand just this basic underlying physiology and basic rehab strategies. It's not hard. We only worked on one system to get these changes. And now she's back a second time. Now we're able to start stepping it up a notch. We're able to start working on balance centers. We're able to start working on eye tracking centers. We're able to do more complex cognitive tasks because now she has a foundation to build off of. And what we're seeing is as we do that, these systems are starting to mature as well. Her balance is getting better. She's able to follow uh, instructions in different multi-step instructions, which are cognitive skills. And she's starting to speak. She's saying mommy, daddy, twinkle, twinkle, little star, ABCs, all kinds of other things. She's starting to feed herself. All these systems, we never once did vision therapy. We never once did feeding therapy. We never once did any of those therapies. We just started working on developing the brain. And that's the best place to start to get them heading in the right direction.